Okay, folks. Uh, let's get started. Yeah. Any questions from anyone right now? Things going okay for folks in the lab? It, it seems, things seem to be going relatively smoothly in the lab so far. Um, my plan for today is I want to continue the discussion that we started about proto threads last time. And the way that I'm going to talk about proto threads today is by trying to uh, write some code in real time, which means I'm definitely going to make errors. So please help me catch those errors. Uh, but I thought that perhaps a nice, oh, am I recording? Hold on. Uh, more. Yes, I am. I thought that perhaps a nice way to talk through proto threads that would hopefully make a little bit more sense about why it's useful would be to actually go into the demo and add some threads, remove some threads, and see how that kind of works. Um, so I'm going to start by doing that. And then I want to uh, talk also about fixed point arithmetic, which is the last little gap that we have to fill in with the week two demo code for lab one. For those of you that have already done the checkout this week, you know that it's not really a um, a gap that is necessarily required to fill in order to meet the, the expectations for this week. But I want to fill it in in any case so that there's no remaining mysteries in that code. So um, let's talk about proto threads. And the way that I'd like to do that is to consider the example code from which you're all starting in lab this week. So the code that we're looking at is the code that we've been looking at. It's in the lab one folder, the uh, audio beep synthesis example. And I'll just remind you that in this code, we have um, two threads and two interrupt service routines. We talked a lot about the interrupt service routines in the past couple of lectures. Today, I want to focus more on the threads. And I'll just remind you that what's going on here is that we have one proto thread that lives on core one and another proto thread that lives on core zero. And one of the proto threads is running. It'll run and then it signals with a semaphore for the other one to run. Meanwhile, it waits, it, it will yield until it is signaled to run again by the other thread. So they're sort of ping ponging back and forth. As I mentioned in the last lecture, proto threads is non preemptive, which is to say that a particular thread will continue to run. That is to say, it'll prevent other threads on the same core from running until it yields. In this particular example for these threads, the yield mechanism is waiting on the semaphore. But if you happen to have glanced through the API that's listed on the course website, you'll know that there are a variety of other mechanisms by which you might yield a thread. You can ask for a thread to yield for a certain amount of milliseconds or microseconds. Um, you can ask for it to yield for a certain interval. Just to say, I want this thread to run every, oh, I don't know, millisecond. So that is 100 milliseconds between thread entry points as opposed to 100 milliseconds in the case of a yield for a certain amount of time. It would be from the end to the next entry point. Um, or you could have it yield until some sort of a logical condition is met. And to demonstrate some of this, I thought that perhaps what we could do, try to do in real time, is add a thread to this example. So the thread that I'm going to add, I just want to add a very simple one. We'll add an additional thread to core one. And all that it's going to do is toggle the LED and then sleep for a little bit and then toggle it again and then sleep for a little bit. So let me show you how you might add a thread to an example. Uh, we would start by declaring the thread by calling the PT thread macro. You'll remember that the argument that this macro takes is the name of the function which will instantiate this thread. So let's just call it proto thread LED. We could call it anything we want. And the argument that this function takes is a pointer to an object of type PT. This is the proto thread control structure. Um, if, you see, you wanna, if you want to see what exactly is contained within that struct, it's in the proto threads header files where that's all declared. So in any case, we do, we've declared a thread here. And we will start this thread the way that we start every thread with a PT begin. The argument to this macro is PT, that proto thread control structure. This tags the beginning of the thread. Um, if you were to look at the actual instantiation of this macro, what you would find, I mentioned very briefly that the way that proto threads works under the hood is with this weird C thing called Duff's device, which allows for a switch case to jump into a while loop. This PT begin, among other things, it opens a switch case, but it does not close it, which is why at the end of the thread, we need to close the thread with a PT end 
which among <coughs> other things closes that switch case. And then in the middle here, we will instantiate the, uh, we'll put all the code that we want to schedule. So we'll have a while one loop that never exits. And all that we want for this thread to do is toggle the LED. So we'll do that using a couple of uh, C SDK functions that you all are familiar with at this point. We'll do a GPIO put to the LED GPIO. And we will set that, we'll, we'll put a value that is the opposite of whatever we currently read on that LED. So in the case that we read the value of this GPIO and it's low, we set it high. If it's high, we set it low. And then we want for this thread to yield. And for this one, let's have it yield for a certain amount of microseconds. I'll yield it for 250,000 microseconds. Um, quarter of a second. So go bleep, 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 on and off, on and off. And that's all there is to it. So now we've created a new thread. The, in order to actually get this thread to run, we have to add it to the scheduler. So let's go down to the core one entry point. This is where we're adding threads to core one. And we're going to add a line here that adds that thread. BT add thread, proto thread, proto thread, LED. So we created a new thread. All that this particular thread is going to do is toggle this GPIO and then yield for a quarter of a second. And then it'll get scheduled again. It'll toggle it, yield for another quarter of a second. And we've added it to the, uh, to the scheduler so that it should run. So let's see if we made any errors. Thank God. And then let's uh, program this. So. So I can now program this and I'm going to do some footwork here and switch our view to the document camera and stop sharing my screen so that it's a little more visible on the recording. And once this starts, what we'll see is the LED goes blink, 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 and it stops for a little bit. Blink, 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 blink. So when it's blinking like that, that's our thread that we just added getting scheduled, 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 scheduled. Why, why is it occasionally pausing? Um, you have a yield, so there's another thread running at the same time? Working yes. Time. So, so we added this, th this thread was added in addition to the other two threads that were already there. So remember, this is non preemptive. No thread is interrupting another thread. So when the other thread that's on core one is running, using the CPU, it's preventing this thread from being scheduled, right? So we, in our, in our code, we have specified that the thread, the thread should yield for 250 microseconds, a quarter of a second. That doesn't necessarily mean that it will run every quarter of a second. And it's because this is a non-preemptive threader. It will say I'm ready to run a quarter of a second later, but it won't actually run until the scheduler gets back to it. And the scheduler incidentally is a very simple round robin scheduler. So it starts with the first thread on a particular core and says, are you ready to run? If so, it's allowed to run until it yields. Then it goes to the next one, to the next one, to the next one, and back to the first. So this will indicate to the threader that it's ready to run precisely 250 microseconds after it completes. It will only actually get to run once all the other threads that are before it in the queue do what they're supposed to do and then yield. Make sense? So if we wanted to make it such that this delay didn't happen, one way that we might do that, let me just share my screen again. One way that we might do that, and we'll look at the laptop again, is to, um, we could, well, there are a few ways we could do it. Uh, the way that I'm gonna do it, just to demonstrate something is, let's just remove the other, the other uh, threads from the scheduler. So I'm just going to comment this out on core one and then down in main. 
I'm going to comment out where we add this threader. It, incidentally, I wouldn't have to comment out any proto threads on core zero. The ones on core one don't know anything about them. Um, but we're going to come out, comment out the two threads that were there at the beginning. So the only thread that is now being scheduled is the one that we've just added. And I'm going to make this and then program again. And what we should see, what we should now see is that the, uh, there are no pauses in the LED blinking because there is no other thread that's occupying the CPU. Blink, 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 blink. See, so now it is, whenever it says I'm ready to run, the scheduler is saying, okay, you can run. There's no other thread that's occupying the time. Okay. So the next thing that I want to demonstrate in connection with proto threads is let's now add a, um, let's now add another thread another one on core one. And I want to have the yield condition for this one be a logical, a logical one. We're going to yield until a logical condition is met. Because I think that you'll find that yield, uh, that mechanism for yielding is really useful. So let's create another thread here. We'll call it proto, proto thread pause. And as always, takes this as an argument. And what we're going to have this one do is we'll start with a PT begin, of course. Oh my God, PT. And we'll end with a PT end. And then in the middle, we'll have our while one loop. And what we are going to do is called a PT yield until, and we are going to yield until the, the, uh, the first argument of this is PT, and we're going to yield until some global variable that we've yet to declare, but we will in a moment, that we'll call incrementer is equal to six. And then when that happens, we're going to, um, we are going to zero incrementer, and we're going to do a blocking sleep for 2,000 milliseconds. So I have, to, I have to go declare this variable. But what, once we get this set up, what's going to happen here is this thread is going to yield control of the CPU until it sees this logical condition is met. The value of this variable is equal to 6. When it sees that, it's going to zero the value of that variable. And then it's going to sit here and block. It's not yielding. It's retaining control of the CPU, but it's just blocking any other threads for running for two seconds. This is just to do something that we can see visually to make sure that things are behaving properly. So in order for this to work, let me, um, let me declare a global variable that we'll call incrementer. We'll say int incrementer equals zero. And um, the other thing that we're going to do is in the other thread that we created, this one, every time it's scheduled, we're going to increment that incrementer. And let's just make sure that we're starting with the LED. Let's start with it on. OK, so what's happening now? What's happening now is we've declared a global variable called incrementer and initialized it to 0. Once this starts up, the scheduler is going to come to this thread and ask, are you ready to run? And it's going to say, no, I'm not ready yet because I'm yielding until the value of that global variable is equal to 6. So this is going to yield. This thread, however, is perfectly happy to run. When it runs, it's going to toggle the LED, increase the value of the incrementer by 1, and then yield for a quarter of a second. So what we should expect is that this thread is going to get scheduled about six times, well, six times exactly. And then once it increments this up to six, this logical condition will be met. So this thread will be allowed to run. And it will retain control of the CPU for two seconds. We should see the LED pause for two seconds. And then once this yields, this incrementer will have been reset to zero. So we'll see the blinking again, in theory, if I haven't screwed this up. So let's see. 
Uh, let's uh, make this. Ooh, did I add it to the did I add it to the scheduler? I did not. You guys didn't catch me. Okay. PT add thread proto thread. Pause. Okay. So let's see if I screwed that up. Looks okay. And let's program this. And let's look at the document camera. Okay, so blink, 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 pause on for two seconds. Blink, 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 pause on for two seconds. So what we're seeing is when it's blink, 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 blinking, that first thread that we added is getting scheduled, yielding, scheduled, yielding, incrementing the variable. As soon as it's incremented up to six, the logical condition upon which the other thread is yielding is satisfied. The other one runs, retains control of core one for two seconds, and then yields to the other one again. So, so hopefully what this is illustrating is once you get a little bit of practice with it, it makes it really rather simple to add conditional uh, conditional code to your program, right? And, and as I mentioned previously, precisely when threads yield control to other threads, that's something that you have to design. That's, that's up to you as the programmer. Um, but this allows for you to do things like, you know, suppose you have some, you're waiting on some condition like the user entering a value. You certainly don't want to block on that, right? So you'd have whatever code that you want to run when the user has, a, has entered a value, maybe it's setting a parameter or something like that. You have that thread yielding until a conditional, uh, a logical condition is met associated with receiving a UART transmission. So that thread, that, that thread will just sit and yield, other stuff can be happening. As soon as that condition is met, it'll say, I'm ready to run now. And when the scheduler gets back to it, that snippet of code will run and then it'll yield again. So you can set up concurrent programs like this. Uh, programs where you, you kind of want for multiple things to be happening simultaneously. You wanna be doing computer graphics and you also wanna be waiting for user input. Stuff like that. Questions about this? Yes. Um, so I guess how do interrupts interact with the threads? That's a good question. And an interrupt will interrupt the thread. So by the way, this is why in lab one, you're doing all of your audio synthesis in a timer interrupt, a timer callback function, which is called, is called from a timer interrupt. The reason that we're doing all that synthesis in an interrupt service routine, as opposed to in a thread, is because as I already mentioned, we can't guarantee the timing of these threads. You could set up a thread and say, I want you to yield for an amount of time that would mean that you would get scheduled at 40 kilohertz, which is the rate at which we're synthesizing audio. But the timing, when that thread actually runs depends what other threads are doing. It will only actually get to run again when the scheduler gets back to it and all the other threads. So we can't guarantee that we're gonna be sending new transmissions to the DAC at precisely 40 kilohertz. As I mentioned, your ears are sensitive to this. The timers on the other hand, no matter what's going on in the threader, no matter what any of the proto threads are doing, they will interrupt them run the interrupt service routine or the callback function in our case, and then we'll go back to where we were in the proto threads. So how, how are like multiple interrupts that maybe like occur at the same time, how is that handled? If so um, generally speaking, I believe the default is that all interrupts are at the same priority level. So the interrupt service routines will be executed in the order in which the interrupts happened. I'm 90% I'm sure that's the default you can assign priority levels to the interrupts. So you could, if you wanted to, you could assign the interrupt, or you could, um, you could make it such that the interrupt associated with a timer perhaps is of higher priority than the interrupt associated with an SPI channel. And then if you're interrupt, in the interrupt service routine associated with the SPI, the timer could interrupt that interrupt service routine. And then it would run, go back and complete this interrupt service routine, and then go back to the threads which are at the lowest priority. In, in most of our applications, actually in all, in none of the labs will you have to change priority levels of interrupts. You certainly could if that's a design decision that you wanted to go for, but it, it's not something that you'd be required to do. Yeah. 
when we define a PD thread function, why does it have static before, before PD thread? Why does it have, why is the function itself declared static? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, um, let me go back to the code. So what, I'm gonna answer a slightly different question than you asked and then, and then come back to that. The, what, what static means, uh, let me find a instance of, okay, so this thread for instance is tagged as static. Um, all of these threads, as I mentioned last time when I was introducing this, they're stackless, which is to say there is no stack associated with this thread or that thread or that thread. There's no, there's no section of memory reserved for that thread so that when it yields and comes back, all of its local variables will have been retained. Um, that's not the case in a lot of other, or in some other uh, real-time operating systems for microcontrollers. Texas Instruments, for instance, has a TI RTOS. Their threads have stacks. This does not. Um, what that means is that if you were to declare a local variable here, if we were to put a local variable here, you know, int local variable equals zero and increment it every time we go through here or something. When, when this thread yields and we come back, when this thread yields, the, that variable is popped off the stack. So its value disappears. And when we come back, it's not gonna have retained the value that it had when it left. Declaring one of those local variables as static, what that's telling the compiler is, I would like for this variable to have local scope. So it's only gonna be scoped to this thread but it will be stored as a global variable. So that means that if we had some statically declared local variable here when, and, and we change its value in the thread, when this thread yields and we come back to it, that variable will have the value that we left it with. Why are these macros declared as static? I don't have a good answer for you. I, 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 I have to do a little bit more deep diving into this implementation to understand why that's necessary. Yeah. So if we don't declare it as static, will it have a compiler error or not? Will it have a compiler error? Yeah. No, it'll, it's perfectly happy to let you do that. You'll just shoot your foot right off. Um, but, but it's totally fine with you declaring locally variables as uh, the, the vocabulary for that is an automatic variable, a locally declared variable. If you declare them as static, they will retain their value. What if you tag one as const? You know what that means? That's telling the compiler, my code will not modify the value of this variable, which on a lot of architectures means that it will get stored in flash. Could you have a volatile const? Pro probably not on this system, but you actually could. Maybe if you were writing Pro, a program for um, an actual, a, a Raspberry Pi, not an RP2040, but one that runs like a Linux operating system. It may be the case that uh, there is some other program on the device that's modifying the value of that variable and you're going to be accessing it, but you're never going to be modifying it. Maybe like time or something like that. There's some system on there that's updating time. You're gonna be accessing the place in memory where time is stored, but your code will never modify that value. So you'd want for it to be volatile because it's being updated asynchronously, but it might also be const because your code's never touching it. In this system, I don't think we'd have a case like that. I don't think. I'm entirely sure of that. Yeah. Will that be like, all the const will not be like using flashes or cache? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> on this system, maybe. I, I, it, we, I don't think we would see that case for the RP2040. On something like a Raspberry Pi, it would mean that the data that's stored at this memory location um, is being updated asynchronously, but not by me, <laughs> but, but by some program external to my program. Yes? So the PTU function puts the thread back in the ready queue instead of putting it in the block queue? That's right. So, so what PT yield does is, um, the, the scheduler here will continue to run the code contained within this thread until the thread yields. And when a yield condition occurs, the scheduler will move to the next thread in line. And it will ask that thread, are you ready to run? If the answer is yes, then the code contained in that thread will run. If the answer is no, it'll go to the next one. If you have a condition, wouldn't that be a waste of time? 
Second every time. Yes. Yes. So um, you are so a waste of time in the sense that maybe you have to get through all these threads that aren't ready to run until you get to the one that is ready to run. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, it is. Um, for the simple round robin scheduler that's implemented here, that would certainly be the case. It could be a kind of interesting final project if anyone is interested in this kind of work to optimize this in some way. Maybe figure out some sort of a, uh, a mechanism by which you might mitigate that a little bit. But you are correct. As it's set up, yeah. That said, the context switches are really fast between threads. OK. Any other thready questions before I move on to fixed point? OK, let's look at fixed point. If anything else comes up, just let me know. So, oh, actually, this is completely unrelated. But um, I mentioned during the direct digital synthesis lecture that there are other applications for DDS. And then I never actually mentioned any of those applications. This is kind of a fun one. Uh, you may know about uh, Fourier drawing. You can, Yibo and Brian know all about this. Um, but what you can do is specify a, a series of points and an order to traverse those points. And this algorithm will interpret. I didn't get that. Way. Could you try again? <laughs> this algorithm, algorithm will interpret the sequence of x coordinates as a periodic function for which you can come up with a uh, Fourier expansion to approximate. And you can do the same for the y. And if you do that, then you'll, you'll follow a closed path that uh, the more terms you add to that Fourier expansion, the better you approximate the shape that you're trying to trace out. It has to be a closed curve. Uh, I, I've just been experimenting this, with this for fun. But for example, anybody know this piece of art? This, this is Picasso's line sketch of a dog. Um, his, his animal line sketches I absolutely adore. And this is a Fourier approximation to that dog. What would be a fun final project, I think, is the only thing that matters here is the, the fundamental frequency is up to you. And then all that matters to get the right shape is the relative frequencies in that expansion. So you could set the fundamental at something that is low frequency but audible, maybe 50 hertz. And then all of the other frequencies contained within this drawing, this only contains, you know, 24 frequencies. By the way, if we drop this to say 10, it's a blobbier approximation of a dog. Um, that's not that many frequencies. You could put them all in the audible range and send it out through the DAC, put the scope in XY mode, and you'd get a dog on the scope, and you could hear it. There'd be a sound associated with this image, which would be kind of cool. And by the way, if you smoothly modify the Fourier parameters, Ebo and Brian did this, uh, in 5760, if you smoothly modify it, you can smoothly morph the dog into another shape. It's pretty cool and, and an absolute irrelevant aside. Okay, so let's talk about fixed point arithmetic. Um, the way I, I will just briefly remind you that the point of fixed point, the reason that we're going to this effort is it's a strategy that allows for us to do fractional arithmetic. That is to say arithmetic with numbers that are less than one but without spending the time associated with floating point. So floating points, one strategy by which you could do this, as many of you are aware, floating point operations generally take a long time. Not on all systems. There, are, there is some hardware that has uh, optimized dedicated floating point circuits where you don't take a time penalty for using floating point arithmetic. This is not one of those systems. Um, so the way that I want to introduce this is just to remind you let me remind you what a signed int is, something that you all know. A signed int, I'll just remind you, contains 32 bits, and each of those bits represents increasing powers of two. So the, the least significant bit is two to the zero, two to the one, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, with at least one signed bit up here if we're in two's complement uh, signed values. So what that means is within a signed int, we can contain numbers, we can represent numbers that have a range of minus two to the 31 up to two to the 31 minus one. That's the range of numbers that we can represent here. And we have a resolution of one. The smallest number that we could represent in this data type is one, a one in the zeroth order bit. 
So we don't really think about the locations of decimals with signed ints usually, but you could, and the decimal point would be located below the zeroth order bit, right? The smallest number we can represent is one. What we do with fixed point is we, we imagine that we move that decimal to somewhere else in this representation. So suppose, for instance, that we decide uh, we're going we're gonna to put the decimal actually between bits 14 and 15 here. Then the consequence of this, and, and as I'm going to describe, there are some ways in which doing this only changes the way you think about the number, and there's some actual there are some arithmetic operations that we actually have to modify a little bit in order for things like multiply to work properly. Okay, but for the moment, let's just imagine that the decimal is elsewhere. Then if this was the case, we could represent numbers in the range of minus two to the 15 up to two to the 15 minus one. We've sacrificed some range here because we have less bits above the decimal point. But what we've gotten in return is a resolution in this case of two to the minus 15. Supposing that we continue this pattern of decreasing powers of two towards the least significant bit. So we go from two to the zero to two to the minus one, one half, one fourth, one sixteenth, et cetera, all the way down to two to the minus 15. This is the fundamental idea of, of fixed point. So, and to create, to create a fixed point data type, all we're doing really is renaming the signed int data type. And then we're going to create some macros so that if we have numbers that we've declared as this fix 15 type, it'll handle things like multiply and division properly. Um, but to the CPU, right, this, this is how we're, we're creating uh, a fixed point data type. And you can see that it, it is a signed int. To the CPU, this fix 15, any variable we declare as fix 15, under the hood, it's just treating as a signed int. But we are imagining that the data point is elsewhere. So, incidentally, let me just let me just pull up. Uh, if we go to the course demo code, let's go to the um, demo code for this week, and we look here at these are the the series of macros associated with fixed point. You can see that yeah, we're just we're declaring. We're type defining a signed int as fix 15. We're renaming signed int to something called fix 15. And then we're going to do some footwork here to handle some of these arithmetic operations. Okay, but we'll come to that in a second. So, yeah, this is the question. So, supposing that we do this, for which arithmetic operations does this only affect our interpretation of the number? And for which ones do we actually have to implement fixed point specific macros? So, how about addition? Suppose you have, you say, uh, you declare a variable type fifth, uh, fix 15 x equals some number, fix 15 y equals some number. You have two variables of, of type fix. Can you just add them and will the result be the appropriately sized fixed point data type? Yeah. Yes, yeah. It's just two's complement addition, right? So addition and subtraction just work. You can just add these two together, two variables of like type. Both variables type fix, you can just add them together. I've already spoiled the surprise here. Does multiplication work? No, this is one that we have to be slightly careful about. The reason for this is if we imagine, suppose we have, we have two fixed point data types where we're choosing to place, we're, we're imagining that the decimal is between bits 14 and 15, which is to say for each of these we have uh, 15 fractional bits and 16 integer bits with some sign information up here. And suppose we do just a straightforward multiplication of these two things. What we end up with is an intermediate variable that includes 15 plus 15 is 30 bits of underflow and includes not 30 bits of underflow. It includes 30 fractional bits, 15 of which are underflow and 32 uh, integer bits 17 of which are overflow. So if we were to just multiply these two together and get the output, it would, it, the, the, uh, the default multiplication routine would just return to us the least significant 32 bits here. Which would not, it's not the right collection of bits. We'd have some underflow represented in here. It, it wouldn't be the right number. 
So we do just a little bit of footwork here. So these, is this too low for people to see? Uh, let me see here. So I'll move this up. So we do just a little bit of footwork where suppose we want to multiply two fixed 15s here. We do the following series of operations. The first thing that we do is we cast each of the fixed variables that we want to multiply to assigned long long. How many bits is assigned long long? 64, 64 bits. So we catch them, cast them each to assigned long long. We multiply them. That gives us this intermediate value that contains 64 bits. The next thing that we do is right shift the result of that multiply, this big value, we right shift it by 15, which just gets rid of all the underflow. And then we cast it back to a fixed 15, which under the hood is just assigned int, 32 bits. And that grabs the least significant 32 bits, which after that shift is now the least significant bit we want all the way up to the most significant bit we want and it gets rid of all the overflow. So the order of operations here is we take each of our fixes, stretch them out to 64 bits and multiply them. That gives us this intermediate variable. We shift out the underflow and then cast back to a fix, which gets rid of the overflow by keeping only the least significant 32 bits. What's cool about this is we've maintained We've gotten rid of all underflow and all overflow. So the, the output number is correct. It's the right number. We still have fractional resolution. So we've done a fractional multiply here, but we've only used integer multiplication. So it's much faster. And uh, I, I won't talk through division in as much detail as I just did multiplication, but it's very similar. We're doing some of this sneaky shifting of bits so that when we do the actual operation, the, the output ends up with the bits in the places where we want it for our chosen, our chosen location of the decimal point. By the way, if we had chosen to put the decimal point instead of between bits 14 and 15, we put them between bits 15 and 16. The only modification here would be shifts by 16 instead of 15. And that you can see in uh, line 36 there. That's what we're implementing. OK, how about type conversions? Suppose you have an int and you want to cast it to a fix. You want to change its representation to fix. Well, remember what a signed int is. It's just. Uh, least significant bit is two to the zero and it's just increasing powers of two. The fixed representation is basically the same except we've moved the decimal a little bit. So converting from fix to int and into fix is really easy and really cheap. It's just shifts, right? So if we have a fixed point data type here and we want to cast it to an int, we just shift the decimal all the way down here. It gets rid of all the fractional stuff, but it should because it's an int now. There is no fractional stuff and it just keeps the integer part. Likewise, if we have some int and we want to represent it in fixed point data type, all that we do is shift left by our chosen number of fractional bits. So these, these uh, type casts, these type changes are super cheap. It just costs you a shift. Yeah. Did I mess with the sign information? If you shift it left and it changes that bit? It, uh, Yes, it could. So, so the thing to be careful of here is you have to remember that the range of your fixed point data type is less than the range of your, your integer data type. So you could, you could overflow it. So you have to be cautious of that, for sure. Float to fix requires a little bit more footwork, but you can think about this sort of as a, uh, a unit conversion, like a dimensional analysis thing, where suppose we have a floating point value and we convert it to a fixed point value. The way to think about this, I think, is to think what does what does one 
in the fixed point representation look like as an int or as a float? Well, one in a fixed point data type, if we choose to put the decimal here, means that we have a bit in this location, which to a signed int looks like 2 to the 15 or 32,768. So to convert from float to fix, it's essentially a unit conversion where the, the proportionality constant by which you multiply or divide to do this unit change is, um, is what one looks like in your chosen, what one looks like as an int in your chosen fixed representation. So for this location of the decimal, one looks like two to the 15. If we had it up here, one would look like two to the 16. And this uh, proportionality constant, instead of being two to the 15, it would be two to the 16. Something to note is these type conversions require a floating point multiply or a floating point divide. These are expensive. So if, for instance, you, so suppose you have like some, suppose you're in lab two and you're doing uh, uh, your animation loop to try to get as many voids as you can, you wouldn't want to be doing these type conversions in your animation loop because they're expensive. But you could, for instance, ask for the user to specify some parameter value as a float, do this type conversion once in a thread that gets scheduled only when the user enters a parameter value it does this one operation to convert it to a fix, and then all your fast stuff is done in fixed point. Square root with fixed point. <laughs> this one's kind of counterintuitive. The fastest way to do a square root in fixed point is to, let me think about this. You first convert your fixed point to a float. You then do the square root on the float and then you convert the, the float back to fix. The reason for this is square roots actually kind of been optimized for float. It's, re it's still really slow, um, but there are algorithms that have optimized and sped up square root operations for floating point. If you really want to break your brain, uh, Google the fast inverse square root algorithm, famously used in Quake. I think it was also used in Doom. I can't remember, but it was definitely used in Quake. Um, they figured out how to, I wish I could remember who, who came up with this. I thought it was John Carmack, but I recently realized, I recently learned that it wasn't him. It was someone else that was working on similar projects. But in any case, the, the, the way that they do it is by doing shifts on a float. If you think about what the bits represent in a float, that feels like it shouldn't work. They figured out a clever way to make this work. Um, which is just to say that there are algorithms that can do very, very fast inverse square roots and square roots. Right. What's that? They use a magic number. Right? There is a magic number involved, yeah. <laughs> Which isn't so magic, like there's a reason the number is what it is, but it appears magic. Um, and then the last thing that I wanna just mention here quickly is generating random fixed point values. How do we do this? Uh, the rand function, which is a standard C, it's a standard C function, I think included in it's either standard IO or standard lib. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. But what rand does when you call it is it generates 16 random bits. Uh, that is to say it generates a uniformly distributed random short, 16 random bits. If we want to generate a random fixed value that's within some range, the way that we do this is by calling rand to generate 16 random bits and then doing shifts to play with where those bits land in our representation. So for instance, say we call rand, that generates a random short, 16 random bits. We're masking it with FFFF, which is just to say we're gonna keep all the 16 bits. If we only wanted 12 bits, we can make this zero FFF. We cast that to a fix. You'll remember the conversion to a fix for ints and shorts is just a shift left by, in this case, uh, 15. So what that would mean is we call, we call rand, that generates 16 random bits, casting to fix shifts them up this way, and then we shift them back down so that the most significant random bit lands just beneath the decimal, and we populate all these bits with the randomly generated ones. 
And in our representation, what that means is we'll get some number between 0 and very, very close to 1. If all these were 1s, we'd be very, very close to 1, within 2 to the minus 15 of 1. But we can play games with this. Suppose instead we wanted a random number in the range minus 1 to 1. We could do something very similar, but instead of shifting down by 16, which puts the most significant randomly generated bit here, right beneath the decimal, we could instead shift down by, um, by 15, which puts the most significant randomly generated bit here. That generates a random number in the range of 0 to 2. And then we subtract off 1, and we have a random number in the range of minus 1 to 1. Basically the same thing to generate random numbers in the range of minus 2 to 2. This will generate a number in the range of 0 to 4, subtract off 2, we have minus 2 to 2. And then you can play games with this by, by adding things together. So for instance, this generates a random number between 0 and 2, this first term here. This generates a random number between 0 and 1. So that gives us a random number between 0 and 3. We, sub we subtract off a fixed point representation for 1.5, and we end up with a random number in the range of minus 1.5 to 1.5. So you play these games, all of which are uniformly distributed. What if you wanted Gaussian? Ooh. Who remembers statistics? <laughs> Anybody remember the central limit theorem? Oh so what the central limit theorem states is if you if you sum together a bunch of uh, completely independent random numbers with probability density functions that can look like pretty much anything, they don't have to be themselves Gaussian, they can have other probability density functions. If you sum them all together, that sum will be, it will approach a Gaussian distribution the more of those things you sum. So for instance, suppose you're doing coin flips flip a coin 100 times and you write down the number of heads you got and then you do it again write down the number of heads you got do it again write down the number of heads you got do this over and over and over again and you make a histogram of the number of heads you got over all those trials it's going to start to approach a gaussian so you could do something like sum together a bunch of uniformly distributed random numbers that sum is going to be gaussian distributed you could scale it you could renormalize it to an average or something like that but it's going to be gaussian distributed so if you want Gaussian distributed random numbers, you can actually obtain them according to the central limit theorem by summing together uniformly distributed random numbers. It's one of those things that feels like it shouldn't work, but it does work. Yeah. Is Rand expensive? Is Rand expensive? I don't know. I don't know what random number generating strategy is being used under the hood here. I should, but I don't. It'd be pretty cool to time it. So how much you time it on this system, what you could do is set a GPIO port before you call RAND, <coughs> call RAND and then clear it afterwards and then use the oscilloscope to measure how big where the volts just change and you could you could time it with pretty stellar precision with the oscilloscope to see how expensive that is. And to learn if it's consistently expensive does it always cost the same amount. Sign doesn't If you're using the math function sign from the standard C library, the amount of time that that takes to execute can depend on the argument to that function. Something to note. Okay, and then what I wanted to show you is uh, on the RP2040, I wanted to come up with some demo to show you why this is worth it. So the demo that I'm going to play is, it, this is one of the demos actually that's in your VGA <coughs> graphics. It, this is an included demo for this course. This is calculating the Mandelbrot set. So know about the Mandelbrot set. I love it. it. It's the most beautiful, it has been called the most beautiful structure in mathematics. Um, there's a lot to talk about with this. But what you're looking at is the calculation of the Mandelbrot set with it, which is a computationally intense process. For each pixel, an iteration has to be run, which involves lots of multiplies. Core zero is computing the top half. Core one is computing the bottom half. Core zero is using fixed point core one is using floating point. And what you're seeing is that core zero is running away from core one. Um, I timed this out and for this particular task, the fixed point using fixed point was about five times faster than using floating point. I think 
Supposing that we did a similar test that involved a process that for which the process involved a lot of divisions. For the RP2040 in particular, I think you'd see an even greater improvement because there's that optimized integer division hardware in the RP2040. So an integer division takes eight cycles. On a lot of architectures, the, the cost of an integer division and a floating point division is actually kind of this it's close to the same on the pick 32 they both they both take about 150 cycles labor day um kids going back to school huh? <laughs> <laughs> they both take about 150 cycles but on the rp2040 an integer division takes eight the floating point i haven't timed but supposing that it's similar to the pick 32 and it takes maybe close to 150 you'd see an even greater improvement yeah uh, then should division also takes less space because you only declare one long That's true. Yep. Um, okay, that's all I have for today. So the plan for next week, we have off on Monday for the holiday. Starting on Wednesday, I'm going to start talking about the ADC and using the DMA, a DMA channel to sample the ADC with no CPU interaction.